Make sure to subscribe to the show and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, and leave a review if you're enjoying the content. In case we haven't met before, I'm your host, Peter Kerr, and I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Yieldtree. Today, I'm joined by Brent Kochuba, founder of Spot Gamma, which analyzes option and derivative markets to make inferences on the markets at large. Brent, welcome to the show. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. Yeah, excited to have you. Certainly, you know, I know a lot of what you do is really trying to figure out, um, you know, where some of the liquidity is, where some of the capital flows are coming in the markets, and really what that means for the direction of markets um, overall. But maybe to start off, you could walk everyone through a little bit about your background and sort of how you came about finding Spot Gamma. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. So I have about uh, 20 years of, I would say, institutional uh, trading experience. I worked for Bank of America and Credit Suisse, as well as an options market making. I was a broker at this firm called Wolverine, which is an options market maker. So I did that. Uh, through, uh, I was with those firms over about 15 years. And then uh, after that, I went to a family office and we started to design derivative based strategies. So t specifically trading options in the S&P 500. Uh, and that's where I built a lot of the models that we use for Spot Gamma. And then so, you know, when you kind of started thinking about Spot Gamma, what were you kind of trying to solve overall? What was the problem that you identified? Yeah, it, it was an interesting uh, experiment, I should say, with the family office because uh, we, we ran these options portfolios and there was a major risk event. And this is going back to August of 2015, where uh, you could see that these big options positions drove volatility in the market. Uh, specifically, if you remember in, in kind of uh, mid-August of 2015, there was a, a Chinese credit event and the market went limit down basically. And you could see there were these big put options positions that we believe really drove the market at the time. And that for me triggered this idea that the options flows or hedging flows tied to existing options positions could really move those markets. So I spent the next few years really trying to design uh, a, a system to watch the liquidity come in and out that was tied to hedging flows essentially. Uh, and so through that, over several years, we built these models. And, and as I said before, that, that's kind of how Spot Gamma was born and, and sort of what it is that we do now. And then, you know, how much of it is really trying to, you know, provide directional advice for folks to take long or kind of maybe, you know, sell out of some of their uh, equity positions or how much of it is just kind of educational? Um, you know, what's kind of like the, the, the main goal overall with the information that you have? Yeah, so everything that Spot Gamma does boils down to really two things. One is volatility estimates. So how much volatility do we think is going to take place over you know the next sort of few sessions? Generally, we only have a 30-day window. And then there's major sort of support and resistance lines that are baked in there. And all of that is based on where do we think that options market makers and options dealer flows are going to initiate, turn on or turn off uh, based on these options positions. And that's both in the indices as well as single stocks. And kind of before we go maybe into some of like the real details of all this, um, I can certainly tell by the name Spot Gamma, you know, there's a lot of things you're playing into there, um, particularly around uh, derivative markets. But um, how, what has the success been? Um, how predictive have you found kind of everything that you guys analyze? Um, and really, you know, what's the success? Is it looking out over the course of one week? Do you guys look out and try to predict, you know, movements over the course of the next three months, one year? Kind of what's the overall horizon that you focus on as well? Yeah, so typically we have a 30 day window. And the reason it's 30 days is because every the third Friday of every month is a large options expiration. Now, every quarter, there's an even bigger options expiration. That's because a lot of big institutional investors will hedge on a rolling basis every quarter. So it's generally the third Friday of every month um, is our view. And then typically we'll see a little bit farther based on you know what the size is basically at these different expirations. And if I could segue slightly here, I think it's been an interesting experience for me because when we first started, in late 2019 and early 2020, it was trying to convince people that the options market had an impact on stocks, right? And if you fast forward a little bit through the GameStop and AMC gamma squeezes and all that, you know, a lot of this almost has become sort of fundamental knowledge for a lot of people, right? That this idea exists that options can, can impact stocks. And to sort of start off and try to help convince people of this, I'll highlight a, a few data points. If you remember at the end of 2018, uh, around Christmas time, there's that famous Christmas Eve low where Mnuchin called around to the different banks and he was trying to, you know, almost like prop up or talk up the market, right? And, and the market was just kind of crashing at the end of 2018. And we hit a low on that Christmas Eve day and people sort of assigned that to Mnuchin calling around to the banks. But it turns out that that Monday is the day after humongous options put, uh, uh, put positions expired on the third Friday of that December, which was, I believe, was the seventh, uh, 21st. 
So the, essentially the idea is a lot of put options expired and that allowed dealers and market makers to basically cover a bunch of short hedges. So that was one major low. Fast forward to the other most significant low in the, in the past say five or 10 years, that's March of 2020. That is the COVID low, right? We were crashing because of COVID and, and troubles in the energy market and all these other things. And the low is the day after the big March options expiration uh, in 2020. You can check this past January, there was a massive options expiration, market bounced the day after that options expiration. And then obviously we had this past March uh, where we saw a 10% rally that was tied to options expiration as well. So these don't have to be short term signals. They can be signals I think that are important for investors sort of across the, the time horizon spectrum, so to speak, to watch. And, you know, I'm just kind of to play like, um, you know, the devil's advocate on, on kind of that thesis. How much of that is also just kind of, you know, overall while being a big options expiration uh, time, also maybe having other um, forces at play, including just, you know, institutions, endowments, pensions, other large managers rebalancing their portfolio, even outside of the option markets, knowing that obviously as they kind of get away from their target weights, they tend at the end of quarters or so to also kind of really start shifting around portfolios. And then typically I would imagine when markets are down, you know, they're allocating from fixed income into equities and kind of rebalancing that way. So curious how you think all those forces kind of play a factor? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I, this is not a phenomenon, the low that we see in every quarter. There are certainly some quarters where the, the, the big options complex, which is really the S&P 500 or the SPX uh, index options, you can see where those there's a lot of call positions, right? And you don't get the same movement in those in quarters or even monthly options expirations when you have large call positions expiring. And the other thing I would say is that this is uniquely a phenomenon that tends to occur on the third Friday of every month. There's also a quarter end expiration, which is the, the last day of the month, right? And so when you talk about those quarter end flows, I suppose some of those quarter end flows could kick in around mid month, but we will see the, uh, the low will come so consistently after uh, the, the Friday, immediately after that options expiration. And, and again, in January, I'd highlight, you get the same phenomenon where you can measure the size of the options expiration, how big it is, and, and the relative sort of snapback rally or the volatility that comes to the upside after uh, after these events. And so, you know, a lot of what you're kind of discussing is also around this this uh, concept of hedging, right? Yeah. Um, which I want to spend a little time on, but, you know, I just want to first ask, um, you know, you talked a lot about the lows and obviously the impact that puts have on kind of establishing some of the lows. Is the inverse true as well, where those that are kind of long call options, you tend to see some market peaks around those same kind of cycles? Yes. Yeah, so some of this gets into the, the way that we model flows a little bit. And I would say you could see that similar uh, phenomenon, I would say, in call options. So when you know that that traders are likely long a lot of call options, right, like in a Tesla uh, or AMC and GameStop back when you know those sagas were occurring, that people were tilted very long, right? People were buying a lot of calls. And you can infer from that that the counterparties there who would be options market makers, and options dealers were probably short calls, right? And so from that, you can estimate how these dealers need to hedge in those scenarios. Now in the S&P, we model that most, most calls are sold by big institutions for yield, uh, looking for yield and that type of thing, right? So we, we estimate that most options market makers or dealers are likely long calls in, in these scenarios and not short calls. And so the flow works a little bit different in that respect. Whereas if you think about who's buying puts, well, people are buying puts, they're long puts for the purpose of hedging their downside, which makes market makers short puts. And so we can, and that's typically how we model, right? So, so the long sort of answer is yes, if you know that people are long calls or believe that they're long calls, you'll get a mean reversion type event, right? If the stock really rallied hard and those calls expire, then you would look for mean reversion in that, in that event. Uh, in the S&P, because we think traders are typically short calls to bring in that, that income, the, the phenomenon is slightly different in the index side. And then maybe it's kind of worthwhile spending a couple seconds just on kind of who the typical buyers and sellers are of both call and put options. I'm kind of curious, you know, how that skews um, also in terms of single names versus any indices that particularly things like NASDAQ and the S&P. Yeah, so the base way that we model everything and, and as you sort of stated at the onset, what, what we try to do here is we look at the options market and we look at the estimated hedging flows tied to these options positions. And then we try to figure out how is that going to move the underlying stock. So you don't necessarily need to know much about, you know, the, the various Greeks and all this type of thing, but you can sort of understand, look, there's big options positions and that is going to impact the stock in, in a given way. Right. So when you think about the options market in general, 
uh, the S&P 500 itself is obviously the largest stock index in the world. There's trillions of assets linked to it. And so there are consistent flows that occur every single week. It, you know, it's a cycle, it's a 30 day cycle that happens. And then in single stocks, what's interesting is you'll have big single stocks like Apple, Tesla, you know, uh, Amazon, these names will have consistent uh, options flows tied to them. You can kind of set your watch to it. I think for example, in Apple, you get a lot of people who own Apple stock. It's an asset they're gonna hold forever and they'll sell calls against it, right? And that's just what they do every month. And then you'll get these other stocks that are kind of a flash in the pan, right? Maybe somebody posts a, a good thesis on, on Wall Street bets and that suddenly will drive a bunch of investors to, to run in. A great example is Twitter. Uh, I believe that was just last week, man, it's two weeks ago now where Elon Musk comes out and he says, look, I'm going to get involved here and call volume exploded. It was the largest call volume day, I believe, in Twitter ever, right? So in those instances, you can look and you can see here's roughly the notional impact, right, on the stock based on hedging flows. And, and the basic idea around this is if I'm a dealer, an options market maker, and, and Peter, you're buying options, right? You're on your Robinhood account or Interactive Brokers or E-Trade, whatever it is, and you start buying calls in Tesla, as a market maker, I'm the one that's selling you those calls, right? It's, it's likely not another investor or single trader. It's likely a fund like Citadel or something. So as I'm getting short calls as a dealer, I need to hedge myself, and I'm going to do that most often by buying the underlying stock. And that's what the general idea is, right? So if, if we know everyone's buying calls, then we know the market makers short those calls, they have to buy stock. And that is likely what we would say is expanding the volatility of that stock, which simply means it's just driving the stock up higher. And so you can find these situations. Again, some of them are cyclical and large and consistent, a la Apple and Tesla. And other times it's, it's kind of a flash in the pan like Twitter was last week. Um, and so maybe it's probably worth it to spend a moment here and just kind of, um you know, maybe find an analogy or a hypothetical to walk everyone through kind of how options work. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of um, really deep education, particularly around what you've alluded to, which is the, the Greeks, which really have to do a lot about option pricing. And we can get to all that in some of the underlying um, sort of second order derivatives that kind of like play into that. But um, maybe to start, you know, you mentioned the idea about the, the Twitter news with Elon Musk. Right. Um, Maybe you can quickly explain using a hypothetical example is why would someone invest um, in the, why would they go long or buy the stock or rather why would they then buy um, options overall? Maybe you could kind of explain in that hypothetical the different um, characteristics, exposure and kind of like, you know, um, capital at risk for lack of a better term. Sure. There, there's two main risks or, or two main reasons that you would choose to trade an option. Uh, let's, let's just talk about calls here in, instead of buying the stock. So why would you buy Twitter calls instead of the actual stock? One is for leverage, right? Uh, you can spend a few hundred dollars in premium. And if you buy one contract, that essentially represents 100 shares of stock. And so I can use a few hundred dollars uh, to essentially represent possibly several hundred shares of, of Twitter, the underlying stock, right? So that's, that gives me some leverage. The other thing is it gives me a fixed risk, right? I know that the most I can lose if this contract expires worthless, it's whatever the premium I paid. So if I bought a Twitter call for $1.50, then, then that all I can lose is $150. Whereas if you hold the stock, obviously the stock could go down you know, 10, 20, 30% and you could lose uh, quite a bit more. So those two reasons are the primary reasons that, a, that an average investor right, would, would look to use an option. And the same thing works on the downside for hedging. If you want to protect your portfolio of long stocks, you may want to buy some put options when you think the market is at risk and those put options would protect you if the market starts to draw down. So you can spend a fixed amount on insurance, say, look, I'll spend 1% of my portfolio on put options and then I can do some basic math to figure out, okay, if there's a 10% drawdown in equities, then I know that, uh, that I'm hedged, right? That's, that's sort of my mass, max uh, risk. So essentially the options give you an extra ability to either hedge or express sort of a, a leveraged view on something. And then, you know, so that's kind of the, the long case. And then maybe let's say someone did actually own the Twitter stock. They saw the great news about, um, or at least the news that they thought would propel the stock higher. Why might they then consider um, buying a put? Well, yeah, the, the put is to hedge yourself to, to the downside, right? If you've had a 20% rally in a, in a stock and you feel great, or maybe right now, you know, for example, you own some spiders in your, in your retirement account. You're a little bit concerned about, are the, is the Fed going to raise rates or the, the geopolitical situation or it may be, you can spend a fixed amount on that put, right? I can spend, look, you know, one, again, 1% 1 of my portfolio, 
to buy a put that's 5% of the money. And now I know if the market goes down 10%, I can do some very basic math to figure out, okay, I'm now hedged, my max loss in my portfolio is say 5% loss. Uh, and that's worth the 1% sort of insurance cost for me, right? So, so that's the, the that downside protection is, is an obvious way that a lot of use, uh, investors use their uh, use use puts. So you also don't have to sell your long term assets, right? There's no tax consequence there because you just pay a couple hundred bucks maybe to hedge your portfolio with puts, and and that again it takes some risk off for you. Yeah, no, that's great. So so maybe then we can kind of start talking a little bit more about. Um, why options act the way that they do and maybe some of the different use cases kind of and 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 how you all think about it in terms of um you know uh those that use it for particularly hedging purposes right more about risk exposure versus also some of those that kind of think about it as a way to trade um you yeah. certainly mentioned leverage which is an amplifier of returns and one of the reasons why people most use it um but you know i think it was the 70s or sometime around then um you know there's really some advanced mathematical thinking around options um, known now as the Black Shoals model, and maybe you could walk everyone through some of the components there, um, and how much those really impact the prices of options, and really how that causes such a deviation between the underlying security. Again, using the Twitter example, um, and how the options really don't trade one to one there for many other reasons besides just the price of the underlying. Yeah, so that's a that's a fascinating question, and the Black Shoals model came about as a way for uh, traders to price options as you sort of mentioned and there's a bunch of different variables that you can play with and essentially you plug these variables into this black shoals model and it spits out a price for you and that's the general model that everyone uses to price different options so there's a bunch of online calculators you can use to play with this but there's a bunch of fixed parameters in there right like what is the strike price of the option you're playing with what is the days to expiration um and so you put in some fixed parameters and then there's a few other parameters that have some variability. Primarily it's this idea of, of volatility. How much do you think the stock is going to move over the next few days? And that is the main place where traders can sort of deviate from one another. You may think that Twitter volatility, you know, over the next five days is, let, is let's say 10, and that's gonna to translate to a Twitter call price of a dollar. But I may think that the Twitter volatility over the next or that same period of time is gonna be a 20. And so I think that option is now worth $2 instead of $1. So in that case, I'm gonna to wanna to buy that option from you, right? You wanna sell it at a dollar, but I think it's worth two, so I'm gonna buy that. And, and that's the fundamental sort of underpinnings of how the most people price options. Obviously, some market makers and, and a lot of volatility funds have much more sophisticated models and, and their own uh, you know, views on that. But, but that Black-Scholes model essentially allowed everyone to meet in the middle, right? And, and come up with a roughly a fair value. I can figure out why you think an option's worth a dollar and I can then sort of adjust a few of those parameters to figure out why I think the option's worth say $2. So that Black-Scholes model really came out uh, in the 70s and, and I guess the 80s. And then as we sort of progress through time, most brokerage systems now will use that model to sort of translate all the different Greeks for you. So when you open up your brokerage platform like Interactive Brokers, it's telling you what the delta and the gamma and, and the theta and the implied vol and all those different you know, parameters are, and that's all generally a Black-Scholes calculation that breaks down the different uh, Greeks, so to speak, for you. And so all of these Greeks play into the hedging flows that we analyze. When you when you consider delta, that's like a hedge ratio. When you consider theta, that's how, how fast options are, are going to decay over the next several uh, days or weeks, right? When you look at implied volatility, it's a very important parameter, particularly now when options in, in markets are so volatile. Uh, you wanna model all of these different things. And that is what the Black Shoals sort of allows us all to sort of, again, have that universal communication tool uh, or, or, or model to sort of look at. Um, and, and if this is something that's confusing for everybody or want a little bit more, we have a, a I should mention, we have academy.spotgamma.com where we walk everyone through what is an option all the way up to sort of advanced sort of volatility trading and explaining how all these different parameters work. So you kind of, you know, really went through a lot of the education. Thank you for that. I'm kind of curious, you know, just knowing what you know, particularly, you know, maybe removing some of the institutional um, players in the space and those certainly that, you know, might be um, more familiar and have used options for, you know, much longer periods and, um, you know, certainly spent careers dedicated to it. For those that are kind of like seeing people, uh, you know, whether it's post on Twitter, Instagram about uh, how much they made by buying options or going long options on any one stock or not. Um, what do you think, you know, outside of that exa uh, extreme example, like what are some of the mistakes or misuses that you see a lot of folks, particularly trading their individual accounts make? Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. It's, it, it's been an interesting few years, right? Because 
over the last two years, the, the market as a, in general was up, what, 40% right from those March lows. And every dip was bought so fast. And the explosive moves that you could see in stocks made payoffs, I think, more skewed than really in any other time, arguably in history. You had, you know, all these meme stocks, for example, just go up and up and up and up and up. And people were rewarded for buying calls and, and moving out on the speculative sort of riskier spectrum. And obviously, this market in 2022 has been a much different environment, right? It's much, uh, much choppier. There's larger swings. It's a more challenging place to trade. And I think the, the mistake that we will see oftentimes is that uh, traders will pay too much for, a, for an option in a, in a given scenario. And this is where the idea of implied volatility comes in. The, just to give you an example, I mean, the, the price of Twitter options got so expensive. And if you measure that on what's called an implied volatility term, that the, the likelihood of you getting paid out on buying a call, you know, after Elon Musk had said, you know, hey, I'm getting involved with Twitter, the likelihood of, of that paying off became very, very small. But traders would still come in and buy those calls, particularly on the retail side, thinking that, hey, this stock has more to move, even though they're, they're overpaying. And the same thing can be happen in a situation if you look at late February and early March on the put side, where the, the market was pretty well hedged. And, and if you look at the VIX, the VIX was up around 30. And that implies that if you were going to buy a put option, you are paying a lot of money for that protection. So much money that the payoff, the, the, the likelihood of paying off that put paying off or you making money on that put decreases dramatically, right? Everyone looks at kind of these probability curves of paying off. And, and essentially what I'm trying to say is that when you have a lot of volatility, oftentimes that leads to a significant jump in the price of the options, right? Whether it's a call or whether it's a put, and you end up overpaying uh, for those for those contracts. Just to give another rough example, you could argue that when Twitter was rallying and you thought that the stock may come down, the best trade would be to sell a put because the implied volatility jumped so much because Twitter was essentially crashing up, right? It was up 20% or whatever it was in a day and then 20% again the next day. Implied volatility got so high that if you sold a put and the, and the stock crashed, implied volatility would drop and your put actually would make money, your short put would make money. So that's kind of the counterintuitive logic a lot of times that I think new options players will come into the market and, and not understand that dynamic, right? It's a, it's a supply and demand issue a lot of times. And so you could be directionally right, right? I bought a call and the stock went up, I didn't make any money, what the heck? And it's because you overpaid essentially for that option. And, and so kind of to that point, you know, I think maybe this is kind of worthwhile and let's remove any dealers um, or brokers from this kind of concept overall. And like, again, most people think about I buy a call or I buy a put, right? Yep. But on both sides, on, on each side of those trades, there's another side, which is someone actually taking the other side and selling you the call or selling you the put. So maybe just using the calls, for example, um, you know, I think a lot of people intuitively likely know why you would go long or buy a call. Why do mm -hmm. folks, um, and what's their thesis overall for selling a call, right? Why do, why do they then want to sell that call, even if they think maybe the stock might be going up? Sure. Some of it is just is purely, uh, you know, value-driven basis. So if you think uh, one, let me get one, uh, one step out of the way. Obviously, the most common reason people sell calls, it's a huge industry, is for income, right? I own Apple, and I want to sell some calls to try to, you know, generate a little bit more income from, from that position. That's the base case I think most people understand. In this other situation, there are a lot of options traders out there who only look at the implied volatility basically of an option. And the implied volatility, again, is an expression of how much do you think that this stock is going to move over the next you know, one to five days or 30 days or however long the expiration is of that contract, right? And so at the end of the day, if Peter, you're selling or, or wanna buy an option because you think that the Twitter volatility is going to be you know, 200 vol points, right? And I think it's only gonna be 100 vol points. Well, I think you're overpaying for that option just because I don't think Twitter's going to move that much. The underlying stock will move that much over a given time period. So that difference in volatility assumption uh, is, is the main reason that people would wanna sell calls. They just think it's too expensive. Again, it's a supply and demand issue, just like with buying a house or or even buying and selling a stock. If you feel like it's overvalued, then you wanna sell it. If you feel like it's undervalued, you wanna buy it. And that's the same thing when you look at a call, right? The call doesn't have to be an expression of the directional move of the stock as much as, is it just rich or cheap based on people's expectations, right? The, the volatility expectation. And so let's let's actually maybe table the um, the pricing in terms of implied volatility and whether or not you know it's you know you're getting value or you're overpaying. But if I'm long in your example, Apple stock, um, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just kind of like a little bit 
unsure of the direction of the next move. Mm -hmm. um, so I then, you know, decide to maybe try to create some um, at least income um, right. overall by selling a call into that market. Kind of what are, what are the different outcomes, right? Um, do I is there a possibility to lose money? How do I make money? Uh, maybe you could walk everyone through that. Yeah. So the the base so, sort of simple explanation here is that 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 you will make money. Uh, the the break even for you is the strike price of the of the call option. So if you bought a two hundred or excuse me, if you sold a, a two hundred strike call on Apple for two dollars, then your break even price is obviously two hundred and two dollars. So as long as the stock stays under that level, uh, then you essentially pocketed the the income from. So if you sold one call for two bucks, you collect two hundred dollars. That's a very clean scenario. Obviously, the, the Apple stock could close at 201 and then there's a little bit of a break even there. But if Apple goes above 200, what happens is uh, your broker then on what's called exercise will exercise that call option, which means that your 100 shares of Apple stock that was in your account will get pulled out. Right. And your net position will be zero at the end of that uh, at the end of that trade. So some traders are fine letting their position, you know, quote unquote, get called away. Obviously, there's tax implications there if you're a long term holder, et cetera, et cetera. So generally what people do is they'll say, oh, shoot, you know, this call went against me or the stock went through my my call strike. So I got to sell the, or I got to close that position. I have to buy that call back to, to, to make sure that my 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 stock doesn't get taken away. Right. Um, and, and what are they, and then, do they? Do you lose money in that scenario? Right? They they receive the two dollars of income by selling it, and then they obviously the other person has a right to buy the stock at the two hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, so of course they lose their shares in overall um, any other kind of economic gain loss for them. Uh, you you sort of lose the, it's the opportunity cost, mm -hmm. right? If Apple goes to two ten and you sold a two hundred strike put for for two dollars, or excuse yeah. me, two hundred strike call for two bucks, there's an eight dollar difference in there, right? Because the stock went to two ten. Uh, and, and you're down, you sold the 200 strike call. So you lose that opportunity cost of 800 bucks. Obviously you collected $2 of premium. So you got to count that in there. But so that's what you won't see red in your account from that. So just you lost the opportunity cost of the stock going up to, to $200. And conversely, if uh, conversely, if the stock goes down, right, then then you just collect the $200. That option expires worthless and you brought some income in. So that's, you know, that's part of the art of it is figuring out, look, I, I want to sell this thing. I likely don't want the stock to get called away. And so what's the right time? Like how far out do I need to go? How far above do I need to go based on my fundamental or my technical analysis or whatever it may be? And then, you know, you, you, you've spoken a lot about implied volatility. And um, one thing I don't know, I, I don't think that everyone knows is, and it's sometimes it's counterintuitive, um, during periods of dislocation, um, you know, when you think about a normal volatility curve, um, it's really heightened in the short term. So actually yeah. sometimes, you know, being able to look through at least, you know, in that 30, 60, 90 days or so, you know, you'll see during periods of market volatility, really rich, um, you know, kind of volatility pricing in the, those shorter terms. But if you look out a year or two now, when things get certainly less certain, um, you see a much more normalized kind of um, scenario right. in that market. So maybe you could walk them through kind of some of those dynamics. Yeah, so the, the dynamic I think you're referring to there is term structure. And, and essentially what that is, is that for every options expiration again there's one let's just say every month there's actually weeklies now but just to keep it simple every month there's this options expiration and there's a different options trade at different values obviously tied to each of those expirations and generally what happens when markets are calm near-term expirations trade at a lower price and we're talking about implied volatility price but they trade at a lower relative price in the near term rather than the long term and if you think about that that makes sense my expectation of what could happen in the next 30 days I can probably predict that better than what's going to happen in the next year, right? So obviously you would have more implied volatility or options that are longer dated would would have a, uh, a higher price, right? Because there's more uncertainty year out. Now what happens is when you get extreme movements in stocks, be it up or down, a stock can crash up essentially the same way it's crashing down. But historically what happens is people get a lot of fear in the market and they'll look to buy options uh, to protect themselves. and because when markets start to crash, everybody starts to look for protection, the price of all options all, all the way out in time starts to go up. And so what people will start to do is they'll start to buy the shorter dated options, which are a little bit cheaper in terms of premium, but you end up paying a higher volatility price for those. So essentially what happens is, the, is what we say, the uh, term structure goes from contango, which is shorter date options are relatively cheaper than longer date options to what we call backwardation. I know there's a lot of terms here, but essentially what that's telling you is that shorter date options get relatively way more expensive than the longer dated options. And that is often a, just a function of supply and demand. Um, sometimes when you, when 
there's so many buyers of something, right, of a call or of a put, the, the price of that option just gets skewed out, way out. And that makes this sort of what you're mentioning before, the cost of the option just gets kind of blown out. Um, and that is not necessarily a function of what traders think they're worth. People are just scrambling for protection and then it becomes a supply and demand issue that, that throws these, uh, the values out of whack. That's great. So, so Brent, you know, we're, we're getting ready to come up on the, on the half hour here. I'm kind of curious, you know, um, you know, who do you think are the best people to kind of come check out, um, you know, your site and everything you are all are doing? Um, you know, who do you find the most success with overall kind of in, in, in that audience? Yeah, so we write a uh, two daily notes every single day. And what we do is we analyze, as I mentioned before, the uh, S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and we write analysis of how the hedging flows tied to all these options positions uh, can impact the market. So that's the, our written content. That's sort of what we're known. There's a lot of in institutional investors, banks and the like that that read that note because they essentially want to outsource, uh, you know, the, the ability to read the market, the, the options flows, right? It's something that doesn't necessarily impact the market every single day in a major way, but there are these times where it's really important to know this information and, and sort of a lot of people I think rely on spot gamma to say, look, they'll flag something when the options market's really important and something I need to watch. Um, so we think that anybody who's a, a relatively active investor, you know, someone with even just a, a 30, 60, you know, 90 day hold period, uh, can take a lot of information, a lot of value of that. So we get a lot of RIAs and the like. We get a lot of people who are swing traders because they want to sort of know how to position themselves around these large expirations. And then we also have some tools uh, that, that analyze individual equities uh, on both kind of a, a longer term time frame, so that 30, term, 30 day time period, and then as well as uh, intraday trading. We have a new tool called Hero, which actually tracks the hedging flows in real time for each stock, uh, for each trade that takes place. Um, so you don't need to have a complex or in-depth understanding of, of options in advanced Greeks. We try to distill that for everybody. And at the end of the day, it's about understanding what the potential impact is on a stock or the stock market as a whole, the, understanding what the impact of hedging flows, I should say, is on the stock market as a whole. Because uh, we believe that these are, you know, these, these hedging flows are the largest, most consistent flow in existence. Um, if you think about like a pension fund, they have to allocate some money. Once they allocate, they're done, right? Uh, but the hedging flows dictate that if the market moves down, the hedging flows do one thing. And if the market moves back up, the hedging flows got to kick in again. Right. And, and it's consistent and it's and it's uh, we believe predictable. So, so you know, um, we did get a question that came in and I'm going to try to ask it both specifically around some names and then also maybe a little bit more around the market. But, um, you know, we think a lot about where and how banks and traders play. A lot of times it's about managing their own book, right? And you mentioned kind of some of these Delta concepts where, you know, all of a sudden when they're hedging, there's a multiplier around what they need to do to their book in order to get everything back in check. Um, maybe you could walk them through that dynamic overall. And then also just a little bit more specifically around things like AMC last year and kind of how all that played into kind of that, um, you know, exponential share price growth on a, on a company that was, um, really kind of in the, in the, in the dumps for some respect, in some respects. Yeah. So look, we can start with AMC. We actually wrote, uh, we we're part of a, a paper sent to the SEC. It's on our, our website that analyzed the options. We call the gamma squeeze in AMC. And essentially all that is are traders bought call options in AMC. And for every time a trader buys a call, there's a hedge ratio and that's called Delta. And that hedge ratio basically tells us how many shares of stock a market maker like Citadel would have to buy to hedge their, the call that they sold to a, to a trader. And so when you think about hundreds of traders buying calls, suddenly Citadel or another market maker like Susquehanna suddenly is gonna be short a whole bunch of calls and they're gonna hedge themselves by buying stock. And we because the, just a, just a, and like for, for someone like Susquehanna or Citadel, like the, they're not really trying to take directional bets here. They're just trying to clip some coupons, right? So they want to be balanced their risk in both directions and just basically clip those premiums. That, that's 100% right. They're, they're, they're trying to collect spread, right? To collect the bid ass spread. I think that they have more advanced strategies now. They may lean a little bit, but they're not here to say, look, AMC is a short, like let's let our risk. They, they can't do that. A market maker has a risk officer just like any hedge fund or you know your own brokerage system, right? And if your risk gets out of whack, you're gonna get you're gonna lose your job as a trader. You, you're not here to take that directional risk. Um, so essentially, you have this you have these hedge ratios that you can monitor. And when a bunch of calls come in and more and more calls come in, it means that dealers have to buy a bunch of stock to initially hedge themselves. This is called the delta hedging. And then what happens is if the stock continues to go higher, obviously the hedge ratio adjusts. 
And so if a call gets farther and farther in the money, dealers have to buy more and more stock to maintain their hedging. The, that ratio is called gamma. So the hedge adjustment is called gamma. So that's what these two, when people talk about a gamma squeeze, it's the idea that if the stock continues to rise, dealers have to keep buying, right? It's a reflexive feedback loop. Dealers will keep buying, which forces the stock higher, which means they have to keep buying more shares to maintain their hedges. Now what happens is all of a sudden, on expiration, like we have a big, ex a fairly big expiration on uh, this Thursday, all of those call uh, call positions expire. So suddenly, options market makers have this big, sh uh, long hedge position in AMC, and they don't they don't need it anymore. So they can sell the stock, and we believe that's what causes sort of mean reversion. Uh, if we want to talk about an example that sort of exists right at this moment, if you were to look at the uh, the expiration for today, this is Wednesday and Thursday in the S&P 500. In the queues in the, in the nasdaq etf it it is a lot of put options expiring over the next two days we estimate that roughly what we call 50 percent 40 50 percent of the gamma position or if that's the hedging ratio uh, of the s p 500 expires today and tomorrow so there's a ton of puts expiring by thursday's close and that means likely that dealers who are short puts are also short stock right as their hedge and each minute now we tick towards expiration, right, on Thursday, those puts are likely to lose value. And so as those puts are losing value, the short hedge ratio for dealers is going up so they can start to buy back their short hedges, right? And so that puts a bid into the market. So we put out on Twitter, we've been talking about this sort of ahead of time that, look, a big position, put position is expiring. This phenomenon is, we believe, what drove the market up in March, that 10% rally that, look, these puts are going away. Dealers who are short stock to hedge themselves don't need to be short as much stock. It puts this bid into the market. Uh, for more sophisticated listeners, this is the idea of charm, which is the, the hedge ratio tied to, to time. But essentially what you need to know is, look, puts are expiring. Dealers don't need to be short anymore. They can buy stock back. So in your estimation, you probably think, um, you know, again, over the course of the next couple of days here, and we're, we're on April 13th now for anyone listening delayed, um, likely a little bit of a snapback rally. And then um, to take that a step further, um, do you consider option trading and all, everything you're doing, you know, again, more of a discipline of technical analysis and fundamental analysis? And overall, how do you think that, um, you know, this plays a part? Um, I think I know your answer, but uh, how this much this plays a part in overriding the other kind of discipline overall? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. So I, I've kind of come up with this new term. There's like fundamental analysis and technical analysis, and then there's positional analysis. And that's what we do, it's positional analysis. How are dealers and market makers and traders positioned in the options market and what hedging flows uh, are going to be invoked through those positions? And so there are these times, right? And some of it is sort of path dependent. We actually think that overall the market has some problems. And that's because if you look specifically, and I don't wanna get in the weeds on this, but if you look at the, uh, the volatility in the treasury market, like the move index and et cetera. And we think that that because of that cross has that volatility, equity volatility has got to catch up. But as I said, it's sort of path dependent. That's sort of the, the story for the rest of this month. Inside of these two days, we know that all these puts are expiring and you can't fight time, right? Those puts are going to expire. They're going to go away on Thursday. And so what is likely to happen to those dealer flows? If that is not a significant amount of flow, then we go, look, the, you know, this is why we measure on a, a, how much GAM is expiring, right? how much Delta, we quantify this for our subscribers. But there are these times where the options market's very large and we raise the flag and we say, look, this was a situation in January where we had one of the largest expirations in history. And that was because there were so many deep in the money call options and all those options were expiring the third Friday of January. And we knew that hedges had to get unwound to that, right? So there are these times where it doesn't matter if you're fundamental analysis or you have technical uh, specialists, these hedging flows are gonna trump that on a very short term basis, right? And, and, and knowing that or understand when these hedging flows are large and likely to sort of dominate the, the, the movement in the market can I think be very helpful for people. We get a lot of subscribers who say, look, I, there's times in the market I just didn't understand what was going on. It didn't make any sense to me. And suddenly I go, oh, look, that's options expiration and 40 million AMC calls are expiring today. That's why the stock went down. Cool, and, and so with that, maybe just to wrap, you could walk everyone through how they can kind of learn more about Spot Gamma, and certainly you mentioned the Academy as well, that I'm sure is a great educational resource. Yeah, they, thanks for the opportunity there. Uh, if you go to spotgamma.com, you hit uh, subscribe at the top, you get a free seven day trial. We don't charge you anything over those seven days. You get two daily notes from us where we analyze 
primarily the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. You get also access to a bunch of tools that allow you to look at individual single stocks, as I said. And then if any of these terms are confusing for you, there's a three-part course that we offer at academy.spotgamma.com where we walk you through, you know, you can start at the advanced level if you want, or we'll walk you all the way through, you know, what is an option all the way up to volatility trading. So we try to cover the whole spectrum there. Yeah, that's great. And, and thank you, Brent, so much for joining us today. Thank you, of course, to all of our listeners. Remember to visit yieldtreat.com to learn more about our offerings and come to realize your next level with us. And also make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss a show. Thanks again and see you next week. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it.